All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, the attendance is on. If you're not able to check in, just see me after class, okay? Um, okay. So a few announcements first. Your first Langdell session is going to be tomorrow. Um, your Langdell is Heather Penning. She got an A in my class last semester. She is absolutely fantastic. She has four kids. They're amazing kids, and she has raised them so well. Um, you are going to be so happy. I think is she also your property like yeah. 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 So you will have Heather for, my God, five hours in a row. I wish I could have her that much. She's fantastic. Um, I asked her tomorrow, again, it's a tomorrow uh, the 15th at uh, 115 and room 514. Um, what I asked her to, to focus on with all of you is the commerce clause and necessary and proper clause. Um, she's also going to give you some uh, uh, fairly practical advice on preparing your outlines, preparing your notes, and preparing the midterms. Uh, she took very good notes last semester. Her outline is spectacular, so I encourage you to do what she did. Uh, any questions about that? Uh, 514. <coughs> Yeah. Is it possible to get that No. No, that uh, this for like I'll record my class, but for this you got to go in person. Yeah. So is this the normal schedule? Because the schedule. I don't know. It says Saturdays. So. That was strange. Yeah, it changed. Yeah, I had to switch who my Langdell was. Uh, so now it's Heather. I think this is her schedule, but I'm not. I'm not positive about that. Okay. Any questions about that? Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Did anyone else's cat eat their name tag? Just one? How'd that happen? So she's a kitten? Yeah. Okay. And it was sticking out of my book. It was oh, it was sticking out. So of course she, so she's our... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have a, I have a dachshund and um, she eats everything. And when she was a puppy, she got into my wallet somehow. And she actually ate cash. And the funniest thing was, I had ones, five, ten, she only ate the twenties in my wallet. Uh, I, I cannot explain it for the life of me. But that, that's how cats operate and dogs operate. Okay, that, but I've never actually had a dog in my homework. In all my years of teaching, I've never actually heard it for real. But so you, you brought me a new one today. I need to bring it to you. I, I believe you, but I want to see it anyway. <laughs> that will be funny. Okay, uh, anything else on your minds? Okay, I'm going to turn this off. If you didn't check in, see me after class. Um, so today, I want to start by putting forward uh, a question for you. And the question is this. True or false? The Constitution was ratified to protect the states. Okay? That's your question. The Constitution was ratified to protect the states. True or false? Your row not here today? Yeah. You're old on, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. They abandoned um, you. I put D because I was under the impression that the Articles of Confederation were to protect the states and the Constitution. Where'd you get that from? Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Shenzhen. Well, that's very good because that's actually the right answer. It's exactly the right answer. So you nailed the next five minutes of discussion, but, but let's. let's <laughs> but that's fine. But we, we, we can talk about it for a minute, right? Why. Alyssa, when you're pressing, you're exactly right. Why is it that the Constitution, unlike the Articles, is not about protecting states? Well, give me a little bit more. Um, well, I thought the Constitution was to protect individuals, and... Uh, where do we know that from? <laughs> but where? Give me some text. You don't have to look very far. Um, where is the beginning, really? Yeah, David's jumping on you. What's what's that? What's the preamble say? Yeah, we the people. Um, I already said what the right answer is, but anyone else put that it was true? I want to volunteer. I know you're lying. 
<laughs> okay, at least four of you did. Okay, so that must be pretty good, pretty good spread. Um, no, this is exact brand. In fact, she stole my entire discussion, so I'll just jump to the chase. Um, the Articles of Confederation operated on the states. It was never called a firm. Uh, it was called a friendship, like a league of friendship, right, among the states. And under the the Articles of Confederation, Congress had no power to do anything for individuals. Everything was done <coughs> through the states. The Constitution took a different strategy. And we see that reflected in the very first few words of the Constitution, we the people, right in the preamble. And the court has repeated over and over again that the states don't exist simply because we want to have states. The states exist for the purposes of protecting the freedoms of their individuals. Whether they do that or not is a different question. But the reason why we have this notion of federalism and states' rights is not because we like states by itself. It's to protect the people, right? Um, if you think about it, there's not much of a difference between a state and a large corporation. In fact, there are probably some big corporations like Walmart that have more people than some states, right? They have more employees than most states have. But the important part is the Constitution was designed to protect individuals. Now, that theory that I just articulated, which I think I 75 or 85 percent of you agreed with, um, was not necessarily the theory adopted by the court. I'm sorry, not necessarily the theory adopted in the Eleventh Amendment. Right. The first case we have today, Chisholm v. Georgia, we'll get there in a minute articulates this notion that the Constitution protects individuals and not states. The Eleventh Amendment, perhaps, didn't agree with that. And the court later in Hans v. Louisiana certainly did not agree with that. So there's this weird tension in our case law when we're talking about the Eleventh Amendment and the entire idea that states are sovereign, that is, they can't be sued by individuals. Because it's premised on a notion of state sovereignty that is very tough to reconcile with the founding and how the founders, we think, understood states versus individuals. Okay? Any questions on that before we get started? Let me turn this off now. Okay. Listen to that. Okay. So, our starting point for the 11th Amendment actually comes before the Constitution, before the Articles of the Federation and before the Bill of Rights, and before everything. We go back to jolly old England. And in England, you had a king or a queen. And the king or queen was considered sovereign. Now, I always use the word sovereign or sovereignty. Uh, there's not a very good definition of the word, but it generally means power or authority. And the king, as the sovereign, as this powerful leader, could not be sued. Indeed, there was this expression, the king could do no wrong. Because basically, if the king did it, that was right. So back in England, if a regular citizen of the English government, or anyone, had a grievance, had a problem with the king, could they take the king to court? No. No, the judges would throw in the case after five seconds. Instead, what they would do is petition the king for redress of the grievances. That's the First Amendment, right? They would basically write a petition to the king saying, King, you're doing something that's not making me happy. Please take um, you know, sympathy on me or out of fairness, you know, help, help me out. But that was the extent of the notion of getting the king to do something. If the king said, uh, no thank you, uh, that was it. And if you continue doing it, you probably go to jail. Did that change when we move from the monarchy to independence. That is, did the same sovereignty that attached to the king come down to the 13 states? Did the same protection from lawsuits that the king enjoyed now apply to the 13 states? 
It's a very good question, and this is one which people argue about for hundreds of years now. This arose in the context of the case of Chisholm v. Georgia, which was one of the earliest Supreme Court decisions of any importance. Uh, most of the early Supreme Court decisions were not very important. So, uh, let's see, where was I? Uh, I called on Lissa. Cortland, uh, give me the facts, please, in Chisholm. Okay, um, excuse me. Chisholm was the executor of someone's will. Uh huh. Uh, he was a citizen of South Carolina. Good. And he sued the state of Georgia to pay a debt that they owed to the person who died. Right. And, and when did that debt arise? Or had that debt arise? During the Revolutionary War. Exactly, yeah. So here's what happened, right? During the Revolutionary War, the government of Georgia authorized a purchase of some clothing from a South Carolina businessman. Um, Georgia got the goods, but never paid up. Um, by the way, this is not surprising. During the Revolutionary War, everyone was basically broke, right? None of the states had enough money. It was a very destitute time. They were fighting a war. They weren't necessarily concerned with honoring debt. They thought, well, this war may not last very long. We may lose, we'll all be dead. So yeah, not so much about the bills. But after the war settled, some, you know, 15 years later, Chisholm, who represented the executive of the Skies Estate, uh, brought a lawsuit. Okay, Cortland, where did he bring the lawsuit? What court did he file in? Georgia. Oh, in Georgia. Where did he file? South Carolina? Uh, no. I'm not sure. Anyone know? Federal court? It was a federal court? Federal court. Who said it? Say it. Supreme Court. Supreme Court. So he went directly to the Supreme Court. Now, I'll get to that in a minute, but um I can't see your name tag. Uh, oh sorry, I was blocked by yeah, Martin. Yeah, Crystal. Sorry, I'm, my, I, I hurt my foot. I'm not exactly sure what I did, so I'm sitting. I usually don't like sitting. I can't move around as much. I don't feel as personal. Crystal, why do you think Chisholm didn't go to a South Carolina court or a Georgia court to bring this case? I'm guessing because he wouldn't have jurisdiction. Why would there not have been jurisdiction in, say, a Georgia court, for example? Well, what do you think? Well, let me ask you, right? You're Chisholm, right? You say, hey, Georgia, give me money. I'm going to, I'm going to go sue you in a Georgia court. What would have been problematic about that? I mean, the judges have an interest in ruling for the state. Well, not just ruling for the state. Would they even entertain the case? Would they have dismissed it? I'm guessing they would have dismissed it because... Due to lack of? Jurisdiction. Why? Why is there no jurisdiction in the state court? Because the state, like, the court can't... It has to be higher up. The state can't entertain something through the state. It has to be Did Georgia allow its courts to hear such cases? No. No. And that's the important point, right? Georgia can control its own courts. If Georgia tells its courts, look, even though you have general jurisdiction, we do not give you the jurisdiction to hear lawsuits against the state. Can Georgia do that, Crystal? Yes. Absolutely. Right? In state court, in state court, unless the state consents to be sued, it can't be sued. That's actually very, that, that, that part's actually fairly easy, right? Unless the state consents to be sued, it cannot be sued in its own state courts. Okay? Now, however, right, because he couldn't go to state court, Eric, what did he then decide to do? To federal court. Okay, now why did he not start off in a lower federal court, you know, like a federal trial court and local circuit courts back then, a federal circuit court in Georgia or South Carolina? Why did he start there? I think he just, you know, do the normal thing, right? Why didn't he start off in a lower court? <laughs> Is it another jurisdictional question? Well, why do you want to take a step? It's one of the only times that uh, they have original jurisdiction. Oh. So you remember from the first week of class, Marbury, right? Marbury sued in the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction. And Martin says it right here. Article 3, Section 2. In all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, and highlighted, when I highlight something, I think it's important. 
and those in which a state shall be a party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. So Martin, what what does that give? What does that give um, Chisholm the the right to do? The right to file in, at the Supreme Court. Okay, so that's what his lawyer told him about that, right? And at the time, Chisholm was represented by Edmund Randolph, who was George Washington's attorney general, right? So no, no, no slouch. So Chisholm filed suit in the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction. He says, look, if the state is a party, I can go right to the Supreme Court, okay? There's another provision of the Constitution that I'm sure Edmund Randolph read and was very familiar with. He was at the ratifying conventions. He actually didn't sign the Constitution, but he ultimately voted to ratify. It says, Article 3, Section 2, the judicial power shall extend to controversies between a state and citizens of another state. And Martin, to finish it up, if you're reading that provision, what's, what does that suggest to you can be done? Sounds like you can sue a state. Doesn't it? Yeah. Now, does it say who's suing whom in there, Martin? Does it no. say the states are suing the citizens or the citizens suing the states? Is it specified? No, just a suit betwixt them. Betwixt, ooh, good word, betwixt, right? To suit betwixt them, right? So here, right, we have two provisions of the Constitution. One that says, when the state's a party, you go right to the Supreme Court. Second, it says, if there's a controversy between a state and a citizen of another state, the federal courts can entertain jurisdiction. Georgia versus South Carolina citizen. This should be an easy case, right? This is basically a breach of contract decision, right? I know it's of a huge constitutional magnitude, but it's basically a breach of contract, right? You said you'd pay me money for this clothes, you never did it, pay up. So if the Constitution seems to allow it, Emily, what happened? Why Why was this case such a big deal? What, what, what happened here? Um, I think they were just questioning whether a state could be sued by a citizen of another state. Yeah, is there anything in the Constitution, the text of the Constitution, that would say Chisholm can't sue here? Is there anything in the text of the Constitution that would say Chisholm cannot bring this lawsuit? So if, if let's go by the way. So we'll do justice. I'll, I'll get back to you, uh, Emily, with Justice Iredell in a minute. But I want to explain something. The Supreme Court that you're familiar with has a majority opinion, maybe a concurring opinion, and maybe a dissenting opinion. This case doesn't. There were five separate opinions, none of which were labeled majority, none of which were labeled dissent. Okay, before the Chief Justiceship of John Marshall, the justices would write opinions we call seriatim, seriatim, S-E-I-R-A-T-I-M. That means separate in Latin. If you think it's hard enough figuring out the majority opinion now, imagine if you had it seriatim. Each justice would write a separate opinion, and it'll be up to you to decide what the rule is. Right, each justice would write a separate opinion, and then you, as a lawyer, have to figure out what is the most narrow rule, what is the holding of the case. Imagine cold, cold on that, right? This case, though, fortunately, is not that hard to decide. There was one justice, Justice Iredell, who voted uh, 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 in favor of uh, Georgia. That's Justice Iredell. And you had four justices who voted in favor of Chisholm. So Iredell said that the suit cannot be heard. The other four said it can. So you have Iredell, you have Justice Blair. I don't know. His face always looks like this in every picture I've seen. I don't know what was going on there, but it's a very strange face. Um, so that's Justice John Blair. Uh, Justice James Wilson is probably the most famous founder you've never heard of. He was a instrumental member of the Constitutional Convention. I think today's his birthday. Am I right about that? Some of you will. I think today's James Wilson's his birthday. I have it on my calendar somewhere. Uh, I think... Uh, Whose birthday? Uh, no. Okay. 
Okay. Well, anyway, I think today is James Wilson's birthday. Um, is it birthday today? Here we go. Was that? Oh, I'm a fan of James Wilson. You have, Je uh, you have J Justice James Cushing, and you have Chief Justice John Jay. So originally the robes were red. That was sort of the regal tradition. Um, but let's go back to Iredell for a minute. Emily, why does Iredell think that Georgia cannot be sued inside the inside a federal court? What, what's his argument? He says that there's no article in the Constitution. Basically, there's no authority saying that they could sue a state. But is there any authority saying they can't be sued? Is there any authority saying they can't be sued? Yeah. In other words, where does Idol get the notion that states can't be sued? Where, where does he derive this from? What principle does he use? What history does he rely on? Um, didn't he talk about English Good. feudalism? Good. And how did it work in England? Well, could you sue the king? No. So how does Justice Iredell compare or equate the king, the sovereignty of the king, with the sovereignty of the states? How does he equate the two? Um, I think he was saying that there has to be some body or some thing that is sovereign. Good. So it's saying, it's a, basically saying that the state Good. is an entity in itself, like Good. a king is. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> Justice Iredell, which is basically a dissent, it's not called a dissent, but you should read it as a dissent, said, look, the state stepped into the shoes of the king. Or maybe put it differently, the state put on the king's crown, right? So whatever sovereignty attached to the king now attaches to the states. And because the states, I'm sorry, because the king could not be sued in court, neither can the states. Everyone get that much, right? Everyone with me. The other four opinions from Blair, Wilson, uh, 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 Jay, and uh, Cushing uh, disagreed. Now, again, these were all people within, what, five years after the ratification of the Constitution. They were all present at that time. They read, they understood. And even early on, you had this disagreement. So it's still four to one. So the other justices said, no, 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 no. We don't have a king, right? We don't have a king. We have a constitution, and as Alyssa said a few minutes ago, unlike the Articles of Confederation, which operate on the states, our rule operates on individuals. So for the other justices, Blair, Wilson, Cushing, and, and Jay, um, the European law wasn't relevant. The Americans had forged a new government, and with that government, they abandoned the principle of the sovereignty of the crown. And thus, there was no sovereignty of the state. So because there was nothing in the Constitution which prevented states from being sued, and indeed, the jurisdiction expressly allowed it, the suit could proceed. Okay? The suit can proceed. Do I understand that? All right, so I'll walk through the other opinions a little bit. Um, Justice Blair said flat out, Europe, yeah, this is this guy, it's a little creepy. I don't know what it is, every picture I've seen, he looks creepy and I can't figure it out, I, I, I don't know. It, it, it's, it's weird, right? They're very angular features, like almost like Uncle Fester or something, it's a weird face. <laughs> um, Justice Blair said that European law is not relevant. The Constitution of the United States is the only fountain from which I shall draw. And because the Constitution extends jurisdiction, these controversies, we can hear the case. Um, Justice Wilson uh, had, I think, a much more developed opinion where he said that our notion of sovereignty does not reside in the state, but in the individual. It begins with we, the people, with good reason, the majesty of the people. Okay? Um, Justice Cushing and Justice Jay make very similar points. Um, one point I just want to stress, though, uh, that's worth addressing. It says here that the judicial power shall extend to controversy between a state and a citizen of another state. Would it be crazy, uh, Kelly, uh, Kat, 
cat, cat eating tag, right? I, I appreciate your name tag, good substitute. Kelly, would it be crazy to argue that the way this is phrased, controversies between a state and citizens of another state, right? If you had to guess in any state a suit, you have plaintiff and defendant, right? Based on the way this is phrased, who would be the plaintiff who's the defendant? Perhaps. Eh, right there. The highlighted portion. Who would be the plaintiff, perhaps, and who would be the defendant based on the way that's framed? Yeah, and who would be the defendant? The citizen of the state. Okay, very good. So, there's a non-trivial argument that the way this is phrased is that the states can sue the citizen, but not the other way around, right? Georgia could sue Chisholm, but Chisholm can't sue Georgia. I don't think that's right, but some people make that argument based on the text. So, I think you can make that argument, but it's not a good argument, okay? So that's the decision, right? The Supreme Court spoke four to one. The Supreme Court decision are final? No. China, what happened after the court's decision in Chisholm? The Supreme Court's decision. No, even the 11th Amendment. Good, okay, so what, what happened? What, 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 why was that amendment ratified so quickly? <laughs> Why did the people ratify this so rapidly? To prevent people suing the states. But why? How do you think this? How do you think the states reacted, to, uh, China, to this decision? Right, you're Georgia, right? You're Georgia, and the Supreme Court in Washington actually was writing in Philadelphia at this point. The Supreme Court in Philadelphia said to you. Um, yeah, Georgia, you can get sued by, by these citizens. I think the, the states would be alarmed. At they were alarmed, yeah. Gonna... Remember, Georgia yeah. didn't even show up to this lawsuit. They didn't even send a lawyer. And this is a CIF Pro issue, right? Remember that issue is if you, if you send a lawyer to show up, you're basically conceding that there was jurisdiction, right? you're conceding there was service of process, or whatever it is. It's the same idea. They didn't want to show up in court because they didn't want to say there's jurisdiction. So Georgia freaked out. And the other states freaked out, saying, wait a minute, this is wrong. We need to protect state sovereignty. So, again, within a couple of years of the ratification of the Constitution, people who were at the convention all agreed that the states could be sued and there was no state sovereignty. Yet at the same time, you have the states saying, of course we have this sovereignty. Uh, what I want you to take away from this is even in the early days of the Republic, people disagreed. There were vigorous debates about very significant constitutional issues with the very people that voted on and ratified the Constitution, right? So here's the sequence, right? Chisholm was argued in February of 1793. It was decided two weeks later, right? A year after that, Congress proposed the 11th Amendment. And by 1795, it's ratified. So in the span of less than two years after the case was argued, the amendment was ratified. And I wouldn't say that the 11th Amendment overturned Chisholm. It's not a good way of saying it. But it certainly changed the Constitution in ways that even today people don't quite agree or understand. So let's look at the text of the 11th Amendment, right? Let's just, just look at the text for a minute. And I want to, oh, I need to get both the screen, okay? So remember, we have this first provision, it says, the judicial power shall extend to controversies between a state and its citizens of another state. Right? That's Article 3. Okay? The first amendment after the Bill of Rights came, called the 11th Amendment, it says, the judicial power of the United States shall not be construed to extend <clears throat> to any suit in law or equity commenced or prosecuted against one of the United States by citizens of another state or by citizens of subjects of any foreign state. So from a textual perspective, you see the, 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 mirror, the mirror images, right? The first one says, the judicial power shall extend to the controversies between a state and citizens of another state. 
And the second one says is, no, it shall not. It shall not extend to any suit. Commenced, that means begun, against one of the United States by citizens of another state. Right? So, again, we had Chisholm, a citizen of South Carolina, sued Georgia. He prosecuted a case against one of the states. So under the 11th Amendment, there's no doubt that Chisholm would lose, right? Chisholm would have lost with the 11th Amendment because a citizen of one state can't sue, here's the key word, right? Another state, Chisholm cannot sue Georgia. Okay? Everyone with him, right? That much is easy, right? That much is easy. Without, without any doubt, and I don't think anyone disagrees with it, the 11th Amendment reversed part of the grant of jurisdiction in Article 3. It said a plaintiff, Chisholm, can't sue South Carolina, sorry, can't sue Georgia in a federal court. Uh, yes, Amber? I was going to say, for me, this kind of felt like what Stevens did after France. Uh, yeah, good, good question. Add, Add a couple words, right? Yeah. I mean, that didn't pass, obviously, but uh, it kind of felt like good, that. Good, very good comment. Yeah, I mean, if you look at just the text, right, the text fits to a T with what Chisholm did. He was a citizen of South Carolina who sued Georgia. This says, a citizen of one of the states, South Carolina, can't prosecute, that is, sue, someone of another, uh, uh, sue another state, Georgia. Okay? So... Was Chisholm v. Georgia correct when it was decided? I think it was, but it doesn't really matter because within a couple of years, the people amended the Constitution. And this is a lesson which people don't really have today, is that when the Supreme Court does something you don't like, you don't have to, you don't, you don't have to just sit and take it. You can actually amend the Constitution and change it in response. We don't do that anymore. Now we just accept what overlords say, right? But back then, they're like, screw this. 4-1 decision? I don't care. Yeah. So you can, this doesn't prohibit a citizen from suing a state, state court, though, another state. Well, again, with state courts, state courts are not required to open up to these sorts of lawsuits. Right, but if they, if they do allow the suit. If they do allow it, that's fine, right? So, for example, if any of you want to yeah, sue yeah. Texas, right? What's that? I wasn't done. The question was, what if you don't like the result? Do you have no appeal beyond the state court? You can always appeal, well, Generally speaking, you can appeal a judgment from the state Supreme Court to the U.S. Supreme Court. Generally speaking. But the issue is the Supreme Court has a doctrine where they're not going to take a case that's based entirely on state law. Right? If there's some sort of adequate state ground to resolve the case, the court just won't take it. So there has to be some sort of federal issue. But the issue is this, right? Say, you know, you're walking along the campus of UT Austin and you trip and fall. Right? Let's say that the campus you know, had a cracked sidewalk and there was negligence. Can you just go to court and sue UT Austin the same way you would sue Costco or Walmart? The answer is no, right? Texas courts don't allow you to just go and sue the state. There's actually a process by which you have to submit a claim. It's, it's complicated, right? But there's a special way you can go to a Texas court and sue the government. But could you Let's say, instead of change the facts a little bit, you're all Texans, right? Say you were walking in, in LSU, right? And the campus at LSU had a crack and they were negligent. On the 11th Amendment, could you go to court and sue LSU? No. No. You could not. Now, everyone agrees with that much, right? That the 11th Amendment um, would make it impossible for Chisholm to bring his lawsuit. But then I think Amber's comment was a little bit a minute early. We look at the actual text, and what does it only say about? The key word here is another. I'll put an underline also, right? Suing the citizens of another state. So if Texas, us, right? We're suing LSU, we're covered. But what if instead of us suing LSU, we here, residents of Texas, sue UT Austin or the University of Houston? They usually sue us, but you know, we, we maybe sue them in return for once, right? Mm -hmm. Is that too soon? 
The good thing about law schools is that after a year, people forget, like memories fade. So that this will be a, a figment of the past by by next year. Uh, you'll, you'll remember it among the last. Um, can Texan citizens sue the state of Texas on the Eleventh Amendment? And that was the issue in Chisholm v. Georgia. I'm sorry, in the next case, Hans v. Louisiana, which is a very important case, a case that law students tend to hate, and I know exactly why they hate it. Uh, I think, Jay, you're next. Uh, uh, give us the facts, Susan Hans. Um, in Hans, um, it was a, the plaintiff was a Louisiana citizen. Good. And um, he sued in um, the federal circuit court. Good. Um, and the plaintiffs were, um, arose over bonds that were issued by the state. During, uh, during what, during, when, when were these bonds issued, if you have to guess? Um, so if you have to guess. Yeah, what was going on around there? Um, the 1870s? So basically, Civil War Reconstruction, right? Basically, during this period, the states were broke, and they sold bonds to try and raise funds for the state. Um, unsurprisingly, the state didn't pay up on those bonds. Right? They didn't pay up on the... The coupons what you actually recover when you want to collect in a bond. And the amount, I think, was about $87,000. I ran the math, it's about $2 million today. So it's like a, you know, it's a significant amount of money. Um, Han sued, he couldn't sue in state court because the state courts wouldn't let him, so he went to federal court. So Jay, he's trying to sue his own state in federal court. Does the text of the 11th Amendment disable him from doing so? Is there anything in the text of the 11th Amendment disabled from doing that? Um, it's right there. Read it. The judicial power of the United States shall not be construed to extend to any suit in law or equity commenced or prosecuted against one of the United States by citizens of another state. Uh, 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 say it again. Of another state. Yes, ma'am. So, Jay, is there anything in the text of the amendment that denies the suit? <laughs> no. No, there's not. Right? So... This should have been a slam dunk, right? This should have been a piece of cake if Louisiana didn't pay up the coupons. There's a breach of contract. By the way, why are they in federal court? There's a federal question. The federal question is the contract clause. Louisiana breached the contract. So they actually sued in federal court under federal question jurisdiction. It's not diversity. There's not diversity, right? It's a federal question case. <laughs> John, why was this case tossed for lack of jurisdiction? If, if it's so obvious that he has that, oh, it's right there. Jay read it. I read it. It's it good to me. I guess the interpretation was uh, different. The interpretation was different. What do you mean? Well, there were some yeah, was the, was the obnoxious clause, which Hamilton uh, was directed, I think, was referring to. Okay. Uh, how that is a little bit ambiguous and how it can lead someone to believe that, oh, yeah, okay, well, because it doesn't expressly say that you can't sue your own state. So, so, so you're right. The court basically holds here that it doesn't really matter what the 11th Amendment says, right? Even though the text says another state, no one can sue, right? No one can sue a state, their own state or another state. Rachel, which opinion in Chisholm did the uh, Hans court think was correct? Which, which justice? They um, praise him, they fet him, they, they give him all the, all the prestige. Bradley? No, Bradley wrote the majority oh, the of Hans. Majority. I'm asking, oh. which justice from Chisholm, there were five, oh, did, they, did, they, um, did, did, did the Hans court think was correct? Uh, where is Not the funny looking one. Um... No. Harlan concurred, that's what you mean. No, not Harlan. Um, uh, oh, Wilson? Was it Wilson? No, not Wilson. Lacey? Did he talk about it in his concurrence? Bradley. Bradley wrote the majority. Which okay. justice in Hans ruled in favor of the state of Georgia? I mean, in Chisholm. Which justice in Chisholm ruled in favor of Georgia? There's only one. Iredell. Iredell. Right. 
In Chisholm, only Justice Iredell ruled in favor of Georgia. And you recall that Justice Iredell based his opinion on England. And he said, the king was sovereign, he could not be sued. After the revolution, the states absorbed that sovereignty. What the Hans court is basically saying, right, and it's a remarkable holding, but I want you to follow me here. The 11th Amendment was superfluous. There was no need to ratify it. Why? Because the states were sovereign from the moment of independence. <clears throat> the state's sovereignty existed even in the absence of the 11th Amendment. That this is a background principle in the Constitution that the courts have to respect. So even though the text of the 11th Amendment says of another state, it's unnecessary. In other words, Chisholm was wrong the day it was decided, the court says. Chisholm was not a correct construction of the Constitution. It was wrong the day it was decided. And because it was wrong the day it was decided, it doesn't matter about the 11th Amendment. No one can sue a state because of this principle of, of sovereign immunity. So you can't sue your own state. You can't sue a foreign state. The states must consent to be sued, and that's it. Rachel? So it almost seems like they're giving up the rights of an in the individual for the population. Like Bradley talked a lot about, about how if we went back on this rule, this 11th Amendment, then we'd be harming the people who came up with the 11th Amendment or elected the representatives to give the 11th Amendment. So, I mean, is that, is that the idea here? Is that, yeah, we'll sacrifice some individuals and their ability to remedy saying, their situation? What the, what the court is saying in Hans is that Chisholm was wrong the day it was decided. That this sovereignty existed from the time of 1776. That as soon as we declared independence, the states were sovereign. Chisholm was wrong. Therefore, even if, let's just say Hans had tried to sue Louisiana, his own state, back in 1792, what the court's saying is that suit should have been dismissed. <clears throat> that even before the 11th Amendment, the suit should not be allowed. Mm -hmm. That this principle of sovereignty has existed since the time of independence, even before the Constitution. So what happens in Hans is they may say, the text of the 11th Amendment doesn't really matter. State sovereignty predated the Constitution. And therefore, in no circumstance can a state be sued without its consent in federal court. Yes? Can the federal government sue the state? Yeah, they can. In federal court? They can. Yeah. Yeah, good yeah. question, right? Is that how you get around states not being able to sue? Well, I mean, the federal government, does, the U.S. sues Texas all the time. But, um, <laughs> uh, uh, they used to, right, perhaps. Um, but the U.S. government, perhaps, is a sovereignty even above the states. So that's a good point. All right? Uh, yes, sir? I'm having trouble figuring out how, how, Hold states accountable well, you tell me. How do you hold a state accountable outside of court? This should be an easy question. <coughs> oh my God, yes. What's an easy way to hold state uh, legislatures accountable? Sue them or vote them in office? Right? Mm -hmm. one of the, and I don't mean to pick on you, Andre, but one of the problems of lawsuits is you see everything through the lens of the courts. That the only way to address, to address injustice is by suing someone. <coughs> That's not the case. And very often, litigation is a terrible way of achieving social change. It's slow, it takes forever, you may not get what you want. Legislation, which is hard to pass, is a much better way of changing stuff. In this case, how would, how would Hans have recovered for a loss by voting? I'll tell you why. You vote for politicians who want to honor bond debts. You think Hans was the only person who got screwed? I bet a lot of people got screwed. And maybe you could pass a bill to the next legislature to appropriate the funds to pay out the bills. Right? Not so hard. Yeah, sure, it's easier to sue the government, but if the state is stealing from people and not giving their best what they want, you can hold, hold legislatures accountable. But if they, I mean, I understand that, but at the end of the day, you just have to trust them that they're gonna well, he didn't get much satisfaction from the courts here, did he? So, I mean, but, but it's an important angle. Lawsuits also have this problem. They think everything has to be fair all the time. Um, 
it's generally the case people get screwed, right? And I'm sure even if they brought the suit to the courts, they probably lost anyway. So there's no guarantee you go to a judge, you get, a, you, get a, you get what you want. Most of the time, people aren't happy. That's why they go to courts. Keep going. Yeah, you're good. Uh, it also seems weird to me that when they wrote the 11th Amendment and they wrote that specific phrase, they citizens did. of another state, they wrote it, yeah. That naturally the next question, somebody would have brought it up. Well, what if. What well, if well why? Them? Okay, I'll tell you this. <laughs> Uh, let me answer your question this way. What does that remind you of when, when citizens of different states are suing? What, what type of what kind, what kind of jurisdiction is that? Diversity. What do we call that? Diversity. Diversity, okay. So the first 80 or 90 years of a republic, the only type of federal jurisdiction was diversity. Federal question jurisdiction existed for a very brief period. They got rid of it. And it came back, I think, in the, in the um, 1870s, the 1880s. So this was one of the first major cases to reach the Supreme Court based on federal question jurisdiction. In other words, if you were trying to sue your own state, there was not diversity of citizenship. <coughs> Therefore, you couldn't get to federal court at all. Even separate from sovereign immunity, unless you have diversity of citizenship, you can't go to court. But here, with federal question jurisdiction, you could sue your own state for a breach of the contract clause. That's why this is one of the first test cases. Right? I can't remember the exact year, someone could Google it. But I think federal question jurisdiction was only brought back in the 17, I'm sorry, the 1870s, the 1880s. I don't have the year in front of me. In the ballpark. Anything else? You, that, that could, okay, so another hand somewhere floating. Oh yeah, Brent. How, how does a state vote to ratify an amendment? Who, who votes in the oh, state? States don't ratify amendments. Take out Article 5. Go. Article 5. Let's read it. Read it for me, Brandon, please. Okay. Give the page number called out. 53. 53. <clears throat> the Congress, whenever two thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution, or on the application of the legislatures of two thirds of the several states. Okay, keep going. Shall call a convention for proposing amendments, which in either case shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this Constitution when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states. Okay. Or, or by conventions and three-fourths thereof, as the one or the other mode of ratification may be proposed by the Congress. Keep going. So how are amendments ratified? Who ultimately votes on it? The legislatures. Not just the legislatures. The houses. Not just the houses. Anyone know? Here, let me go back to the question I began today. Who ultimately votes to ratify the Constitution? The people. The people. Conventions. What is a convention of the states? It's a group of people voting. It's not just the government. In other words, the states don't have to sign off on amendments, right? They can get the process rolling to start what's called a convention. But all 27 amendments have been ratified not by state legislatures, but by conventions of the people. So what's a recognized convention? Um, ask me after class. It gets complicated. Okay. Uh, there's actually now a project going on known as the Convention of the States. And we're actually close to the point, I think we need... 25 or 26, I, might, I can't never remember the math, but we're close to the two-third marks of states that have approved the language of a balanced budget amendment. And once you get to two-thirds, at that point, conventions of the states are called. And if three-fourths of the states agree on this language, there's three-fourths of the state conventions, then it becomes part of the Constitution. Um, <coughs> I'm not optimistic that happens, but we have had a number of constitutional amendments in recent decades that were ratified and approved. But the people approved them. But I sense your, your, your thing, it's saying, why would the framers of the 11th Amendment, if they were trying to create this broad principle of sovereign immunity, use this precise language, right? Let me, let me edit this, and don't, don't put this to your nose, right? Right? What they just said instead of another, any, right? 
I'll give you a second, yes. Yes. What they just said, that any, right? Let's watch it, ready? It was another, now it's any. If they had drafted that, that'd be easy, right? That'd be, that'd be a piece of cake. Everyone agree with me, right? If it said sued by system of any state, well, okay, they lose, but they chose the word another. That is a word with meaning. It means a different one. Not betwixt, but, you know, opposed, right? But the court says, I think they have to say this, there is no reason why the 11th Amendment matters because this principle of sovereignty predates the Constitution. Case, patiently waiting. Well, I just was thinking if they put any, they might not have had enough people vote for it? Is there like, we Oh, so maybe not everyone agreed with this sovereign immunity idea. That's what you're saying. Maybe I mean, this wasn't... Up until, at the time that this was, I mean, ah. the court, court. That's a good thought. Yeah, Carla. I would think if they put any, then that kind of takes away from the state's own ability to decide if I want to limit my own citizens from... Serving. Well, but that's in federal court. Right? When we say the judicial power, we're talking about federal judicial. States can always open up their own courts however they wish. That's no question. So Harlan, and we'll talk a lot about Justice Harlan. He, I think, is probably, if not my most favorite justice, definitely the top five for sure. Um, Harlan says, I agree that under current law, um, the state can't be sued here. Uh, but he basically says, I think Chisholm was probably right when it was decided. He doesn't quite say basically like, well, I won't comment on Chisholm because that decision was correct at the time it was decided. I think Harlan's exactly right. So even if Chisholm was right, Harlan says, the 11th Amendment changed enough that he'll go along with it. But this is a sore point in all of constitutional law. Because you have this amendment which uses this word another. And the Supreme Court just took a red pen and they crossed it out and they said any. Right? That's that's basically what we have today. So any questions from you on Hans or Chisholm? Very important cases most people don't even read. Very important. Uh, yes, Crystal. In criminal cases today, I'm assuming that's because of the 11th Amendment, you say the people of the United States versus the defendant? Versus, who, who's the prosecuting? people, the people of the state. Yes. But before, was it just the state instead of the people of the state? Um, See, I'm just curious. It's actually, so, so, so let me do all this. So it's, it's, it's not, you know, the people versus Larry Flint, right? You ever seen that movie? It's actually the people of California. So some states actually, um, whenever there's a criminal case, say it's the people versus defendant, whatever his name is. And a lot of criminal defense lawyers hate that, right? Because it's basically like their guy, right? Their client versus the people. So there was a case maybe a year or two ago where there was a defense lawyer who refused to call the government <laughs> the people. He said, the government is coming after my client. And the prosecutor objects saying, Your Honor, in this state, the prosecutor is called the people. And the defense lawyer was like, no, 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 no. I am not humanizing this prosecution. You're the government. You're the prosecutor. And I can't remember if the lawyer got in trouble, or I, I don't remember what happened, you can Google it, but there was a there was this conflict, because when you say the people, it's actually not the people, it's an elected prosecutor who's indeed elected, but it's not citizen of a state. And in any event, I think this is a, a civil provision, not a criminal provision, and also, those are state court prosecutions, not federal court prosecutions, but the, your, your instinct about the people, right? It sounds a little bit, the people bring this case against this criminal, right, a defendant, versus the government. What sounds better? The people or the government? I think that defense attorney has, was on to something. Okay. Any other questions on Hans or Chisholm? No? Okay. So why am I detouring from our unit on federalism to the 11th Amendment? Well, the 11th Amendment is a limit. Right? The 11th Amendment imposes a limit on the states. How? Sovereign immunity prevents a state from being sued. States like sovereign immunity, right? States don't want to be sued. But can Congress 
waive a state's sovereign immunity. What? Can Congress allow private citizens to sue a state? So the key word here, and I'm going to write the sentence, can Congress waive, another big word is abrogate, it just means waive, a state's sovereign immunity? So that, that's your question. Can Congress waive or abrogate a state's sovereign immunity? Right? If this, you know, the sovereign immunity came from England, and came from the crown as the Chisholm I'm sorry, as the Hans Court said, can Congress ever waive it? All right, so here's the question. We jump ahead to the 14th Amendment. We'll cover the 14th Amendment a lot in the second half of this semester. But for now, I want to focus on two provisions, one of which you've almost certainly heard of, the second you've probably never heard of, unless I mentioned it earlier. So the first is what's called the Equal Protection Clause, Probably have all heard. It says, nor shall any state deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. And at least for the last 50 or 60 years or so, that means the government can classify people on the basis of gender and race and perhaps other things. Okay? Fair. That's section one of the 14th Amendment. Look at section five of the 14th <coughs> Amendment. And it says, the Congress shall have power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. What is that? What's going on there, right? So I told you the first week of class, or let me have the second week of class, that all of Congress's powers are listed in Article 1, Section 8, right? Regulating commerce, taxing, you know, punishing pirates, right? All those things. I lied to you. After the ratification of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, the Reconstruction Amendments, which banned slavery and all, Congress gained new powers. Congress gained new powers through ratification of these amendments. And Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, I'll just quote Section 5 to be short, but Section 5 of the 14th Amendment expressly gives Congress new authority. And new authority to do what? <laughs> to enact legislation that enforces this article, meaning this amendment. Congress has the power to enforce the 14th Amendment. Okay? One of the ways that Congress can prevent the states from violating people's equal protection is by allowing the state to be sued in federal court. Let me say that again. One of the ways that Congress can ensure that states comply with the 14th Amendment is through the pocketbook. And say, we will open up the federal courts if a state violates someone's civil rights that is how you have civil rights legislation. Congress acts to waive or abrogate a state's sovereign immunity. They're saying, there's this violation of the law, and we're going to enforce the 14th Amendment by allowing private causes of action in federal court where you get damages. The general rule is you can't sue a state even if it messes with you. But if Congress acts to waive the state's sovereign immunity, then you can go to federal court. And then you can sue the state. So I'm sure you've all heard of 19, Section 1983, right? It's a civil rights cause of action. So let's say a state police officer brutalizes you and beats the crap out of you, right? You can sue in state court if you want. But you can also go to federal court because you violated your Fourth Amendment rights as an unlawful seizure of your person. Now, generally, you can't sue a state police officer in federal court, but Congress passed a statute which said you can. You can go to federal court. All right, does everyone get with me so far, right? That Congress, since the ratification of the Reconstruction Amendments, has seen fit to allow states to be sued 
under certain circumstances. Okay? Everyone with that? The difficulty arises of when can Congress abrogate a state sovereign immunity, right? What sorts of constitutional violations permit the states to bring, I'm sorry, what sort of constitutional violations permits Congress to waive the state's immunity? Okay, everyone with me. Um, for most of the 20th century, the simple answer was basically, Congress can do whatever it wants. If Congress sees a problem, they can allow the states to be sued. This was in keeping with the general notion of the Commerce Clause, right? If Congress wants to regulate something, they can regulate it. By the 1990s, in a series of decisions, the court said, no, 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 there are limits on when Congress can, ex I'm sorry, waive a state's sovereign immunity. There are limits on when Congress can waive a state's sovereign immunity. Again, we're not moving strictly kind of logically, but this is like 1997, 98, 99, at the same time that Lopez, Morrison, right, are being decided on the Commerce Clause front, the court began to decide cases on the sovereign immunity front. And the question was this, could Congress allow a state to be sued in various circumstances? So, what? I'm going to go by Justice Blair. Um, creepy. Uh, it really looks creepy. I, I, have a, I have a Justice Blair bobblehead upstairs. It's very weird. Um, <laughs> what? Yeah, it's a little bobblehead. So, the first case I want to talk about applying this doctrine is called City of Bernie versus Flores. Anyone from Bernie, Texas? Nearby? I get all these ones. I actually had a student go to this church a couple years ago. Which was nice. Um, so this case began as a fairly boring zoning dispute, right? This case of probably one of the most significant constitutional cases in the last 30 years, up there, I think, began as a very you know boring zoning dispute. All right, Lacey, back to you. What 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 was the zoning dispute at issue in uh, Bernie v. City of Flores? I'm sorry, City of Bernie v. Flores. What was the zoning for the church? What, what was the zoning issue there? Um, they were trying to deny the church building um, a permit. That what, was what did the church want to do? Under the RF. Well, before we get to RIFRA, before we get to there, okay. what did the church want to do? This is a boring case, right? Boring or boring? Boring. Okay. What did the church want to do? They wanted to build its church. Or build a church? Permit. Yeah, have a permit for their church on this property. Did they already have a church? Uh, no. No. They want to construct one. No, they already had a church. Uh, I think you're up, Jessica. What, what, what right. the church want to do here? They wanted to expand the church. Yes. They wanted to expand the church, right? And what did the city of uh, Bernie tell them? Yeah. Why, why not? They wanted to give them permits because it was a historic district. Very good. So um, you all live in Houston, which doesn't have an official zoning code. It's not like a quasi zoning code. You'll take my property class next semester, perhaps. Um, the issue here was that the city said, look, you have a beautiful church. Look at these pictures, right? Isn't that a gorgeous church? Your church is so beautiful. We don't want to give you a permit to change it because it's so beautiful. It's a historical site, and we want you to keep exactly the same way. And Flores, I think was the archbishop, was like, come on, I need this permit because I don't have enough space to fit all my parishioners. Uh, query if it's still being overcrowded today, but you know, church attendance is on decline. Uh, but this, this you know, is a, a fairly small church and they said they need more space. So, uh, Jessica, generally speaking, let's say there was no federal law in the books. If Archbishop Flores was unhappy with this decision, what would he, what, what were his remedies? If he was unhappy with his zoning decision, what were his remedies? There's no federal statute, right? Generally, what are his remedies in general if there was no federal statute? Sue so who? The state. In what court? Do you sue in federal court? <coughs> no. Why not? Because it's not a federal question. Well, not just because it's not a federal question. 
Why could not he sue in federal court? The 11th. 11th Amendment, right? Well, is it 11th Amendment or is it Hans? Which one is it actually? You're not wrong. The answer is the 11th Amendment, but it's really the 11th Amendment as interpreted by Hans. But under Hans in Louisiana, he can't sue his own state, right? Archbishop of Florida is a Texan, can't sue Texas. Okay? Daniel, could you sue in state court? No. Why not? Yeah. Um, you'll do this when you study property, too, but generally speaking, when there's a zoning dispute, you can't sue the city. You have to go through a fairly elaborate process with a, with a zoning commission and a zoning board of appeals, and, uh, you know, there, there might be some sort of judicial review, but it's very difficult, right? He wasn't interested in going through this administrative process, which was going to roll against him. Instead, Daniel, what did Archbishop Flores do? Well, what court did he sue in? Federal court. And what statute did he rely on in his lawsuit? Uh, yeah, you said it right. Very good. So we have here a statute known as the Religious Freedom <laughs> Restoration Act. The acronym is RIFRA, which is pronounced RIFRA. RIFRA. Okay. Not to be outdone by my favorite actor of all time, Riliupa. Ready? The Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. Riliupa. Re, it's like Rihanna, but Re, Liupa. Okay? Uh, maybe you have to know it, I don't know. But the first one at least is on the exam. So, <laughs> RIFRA is the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Uh, let me give you a brief background of why this case came about. Um, in 1990, there was a case, Oregon, called Employment Division versus Smith. And at issue in that case was a Native American who used peyote, which is a, like a cactus hallucinogen thing, right? It's a religious sacrament. He was fired from his job because of his use of peyote, and he sought to collect unemployment. And the government denied him unemployment benefits, saying, look, you were fired for illegal drug use. We're not giving you any benefits. He sued, saying that that law imposes a burden on his religious exercise. Okay? In a very controversial Supreme Court decision, five to four, the court ruled against the Native American. The court said, look, this is a neutral law. It says you can't do drugs, period. It doesn't single out Jews or Christians or Muslims or anything else. As a result, the state can deny you the benefits. Now, a lot of you are saying, wow, that's not fair. Congress agreed. And Congress passed a statute about a year or two later called RIFRA. This was passed almost unanimously in the House and almost unanimously in the Senate, and President Clinton signed into law. Basically, everyone agreed that the opinion in the Smith case was wrong. And they tried to pass a statute. So what did Griffith say? I'm going to summarize it because it's not too important. If the state substantially burdens your free exercise of religion, right, if the state imposes a substantial burden on your free exercise of religion, you can go to federal court and sue the state, or in this case the city. Right? So the general rule is you cannot sue the city of Bernie in federal court. But Congress says you can sue them if they impose a substantial burden on your free exercise of religion. And Archbishop Flores said, look, the denial of the zoning permit burdens our free exercise because we can't welcome in from the community as many people as we want to welcome in. He said, look, we got this brand new statute, right? I'm going to court, and I'm going to say that this burdens our free exercise. I want to understand the basic facts, right? So the question is this, right? Could Congress through RIFRA waive Texas' sovereign immunity, right? This is the question I keep asking. Can Congress waive Texas' sovereign immunity? There are a lot of constitutional law cases from Texas. I don't know what it is. There's just, there are a lot of them. We'll do a bunch of them this year. But we have, I, I think we're a locus for, for dispute. 
Can Congress waive Texas's sovereign immunity and allow the city of Bernie to be sued for the violation of the zoning permit, or for the denial of the zoning permit? Okay. <coughs> Right, Andre, let's walk, walk you through this decision. So first off, did the Supreme Court say that Texas can be sued and that Bernie can be sued? Yes. They did? We agree with Oh, yeah. What's, what's the holding? Just give me the holding first. Um, then no. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Tell me why. <laughs> um, it's beyond the scope of Section 5's enforcement power. Tell me why. Uh, the law was directed exclusively against the actions of private persons without reference to the laws of the state or their administration by their officers. Okay. <laughs> so he, the first part is correct, right? The court holds that Congress lacked the power to waive the sovereign immunity of the state here, right? <laughs> but the reason why is important to address, okay? So first off, let's go back to the 14th Amendment, okay? Uh, I don't have it up here. So if you go to the 14th Amendment in your Constitution, you'll see several provisions. Um, uh, just pull out the page number, section one. Okay. Okay. So, actually, I'll, I'll do this one later. Um, So Congress, I'm sorry, the 14th Amendment says that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property of the due process of law, right? That's what it says. No state shall deprive a person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. You haven't learned this yet, but you'll learn it now. How do you define the word liberty in the 14th Amendment, right? How do you give meaning or substance to the word liberty in the 14th Amendment? The Supreme Court has determined that among these liberty interests are the provisions of the Bill of Rights. The free exercise clause, which guarantees rights of free religion, is one of the liberty interests protected by the 14th Amendment. Okay? As a result, as a result, if a state is violating your free exercise, if a state is violating your free exercise, Congress can act. I wouldn't understand that, right? If a state violates your rights of free exercise of religion, Congress can allow the state to be sued. But here's the rub, and this is why this case is, is a little bit hard to understand before we do the First Amendment. I said a moment ago, the Supreme Court held in the Peyote case, the Smith case, that Laws that generally affect religion are fine. And then Congress disagreed with that and said, no, 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 you guys got it wrong. That's not what the First Amendment means. Zach, which branch of government has taken on itself the power to interpret the Constitution? And what happens if Congress tries to redefine a Supreme Court's opinion by statute. Ah. Uh, you see the problem, right? Sorry. You see the problem, right? The Supreme Court said that because Congress tried to redefine the meaning of the First Amendment, they went too far. Under the Section 5 powers, they can do what's called prophylactic, right? If you know this word in context, I can never spell it right, prophylactic. Tell me how Google. Prophylactic. <coughs> Thank you. Congress can use Section 5 powers in a prophylactic manner. In a prophylactic manner. That is, they can stop constitutional violations. But they can't redefine the Constitution, right? So they can prevent constitutional violations, but they can't redefine the Constitution. 
What the court says in Bernie is that it's for the Supreme Court to define what liberty means, not Congress. I don't know if that's right. I think it's probably wrong. I think it's very wrong, actually. But that's what the court says here in Bernie. And there are limits on Section 5. So here's the, here's the test, right? Congress can take measures to remedy unconstitutional actions. Congress cannot make substantive changes in the law. Everyone understand the test. It's easy enough to state, hard to apply. They can remedy, that is, allow lawsuits for unconstitutional actions, but they cannot make substantive changes to the law. So here's the test, and I need to type this out because I, I never remember it. There must be a congruence and proportionality between or betwixt the injury to be prevented or remedied and the means adopted to that end. What's up? There must be a congruence and proportionality between the injury to be prevented and the means adopted to that end. Anthony, help me out, my friend. What the hell does that mean? Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Thank you. So, you're the boss. Let's go. Let's go. What on earth? I mean, I'm sure you all read it and were scratching your heads. Like, what? Yeah, because let's focus on this for a minute. Let's let's take this one at a time, right? What does congruence and proportionality mean, Anthony? Do you know what those words even mean? I don't know what congruence means. Okay, good. Let's go proportionality. What's proportionality? I think it means where it's like equal to each. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good case. Want to take a stab? I think we're. I think we're, we'll get there eventually. Might take a few. Might take a minute or two. What What the hell's going on there? I think it just means like whatever, um, whatever action they take can't like completely uh, be out of proportion with um, the actual injury, so they can't can't make a right. Okay, injury. good. I think I like the way you phrase that. Right. So let's say you have an injury, right? A zoning dispute. All right. In this grand scheme of things, that's pretty trivial. Right? That's pretty trivial. Whether they get the building permit or not, really, who the hell cares? But the means, right, the means is allowing the state to be sued. The court says that's a really big deal. So you have this, like, humongous weapon allowing the state to be sued <coughs> for a really small injury. What the court says is the means don't justify the ends, right? You have this little injury and this massive, you know, this massive tool, this lawsuit. That's not enough. They're not proportional. They're not congruent. That is, they don't fit. So what this is trying to say, and again, I stumble this every semester when I have to teach this case, is you have to look at, at how closely is the means, that is the tool using, to the ends, right? How close does this fit? This is similar to the question we'll call scrutiny, right? Congress can't act too far to redress small injuries. If it's a small injury, the remedy must be small. But the lawsuit is a huge remedy, okay? Now, that's the test. But the precise issue, right? The precise issue is this. <coughs> Is there even an injury here, right? Is Texas, even, I'm sorry, is the church, is Archbishop Flores even being injured? And the court said he's not. So here, there is zero constitutional injury. And because there's zero constitutional injury, can there even be a remedy? No. Where there's no injury, there cannot be a remedy. 
the entirety of RIFRA is premised on trying to reverse the Supreme Court decision. And the justices say, no, 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 I put down the right, no, 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 that's for us to decide, not you. And because there's zero injury, there could be zero remedy. And the statute permitting the lawsuit against the jurisdiction, against the state, cannot stand. Everyone with me? All right? I'll get a second, right? So the key point here, the key thing I want you to take away from this is when there's no constitutional injury, there cannot be a remedy. There cannot be lawsuits. But if there's a small constitutional injury, that also will not be enough. You need a big constitutional injury to justify the big remedy of waiving a state's sovereign immunity. I was going to ask, um, wouldn't this prohibit for, uh, like more parishioners coming to the church? Not oh yeah, it. it's gonna be a fire hazard. I mean, the fire marshal shuts you down. But you get to a certain limit, you can't bring him in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So there's definitely a burden on religion, and but take my word for it. Under the Supreme Court decision, the Peyote case, that's too bad. Build a second church nearby. You're supposed to hand off. Well, I, I don't understand how we determine mm. if it's constitutionally. Where, where, where? What citation, Alyssa, was next to this congruence proportionality test? Was there anything? No, they made it up. They made it up, right? This congruence and proportionality test was basically made up. But I'll, I'll give it a defense, right? I will give it a defense. So go back up to section five of the 14th Amendment. There's an important word here, which is appropriate, right? Appropriate. It says, Congress shall have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. That doesn't mean they can pass whatever legislation they want. It means it has to be appropriate. So the way I read the congruence and proportionality test is they're trying to determine what appropriate means. Now, the opponents, the dissent say rational basis, right? So long as a government basically has a rational basis to believe that there's some problem, that's appropriate. But here, they're applying scrutiny. They're saying there has to be a fit between the means and the ends. And this is a serious, vigorous, contentious issue. All right? So the way they define appropriate, I think, is by saying congruent proportionality. But when you're applying it, you have to understand what is the size of the constitutional injury and what is the size of the remedy that is waiving the immunity. And with the exception of Hibbs, Hibbs is the outlier, the Nevada case, the court keeps saying injury is not big enough to justify the suspension. Uh, the, the waiving of sovereign immunity, the abrogation. Andre, I think your hand was up a minute ago or somewhere in the back. Well, I mean, it just, I kind of, it makes me think of like this test, like with, with Hobby Lobby. Oh, oh, we'll get to Hobby Lobby. Well, what Hobby Lobby? Tell us about Hobby Lobby. I'm just trying to figure out how they apply it. Oh, thank you. you. This is my question five minutes and I'll do it now. Um, RIFRA, as a statute, as drafted, applies to both the state governments and the federal government. In Bernie v. Flores, the court said RIFRA is unconstitutional as applied to the, Andre? Which branch of government? Oh, uh, uh, le legislature. No, no, no. RIFRA could not be applied to whom? I'll say it again. RIFRA was designed to apply to the state governments and the federal governments. In Bernabe Flores, the court held RIFRA cannot be applied to whom? States. Good. What about the feds? Does it say anything about the federal government? I'm assuming that it could not. Well, what's the issue, right? Can Congress allow itself to be sued? Can Congress waive the immunity of the United States government? If it wants to? Well, well why, why couldn't it? Is there anything stopping Congress from allowing the United States to be sued? Um, no. No, there's not. If Congress wants to let itself be sued, right? If Congress wants to let the United States be sued, they can do that. That's not a problem. The problem only arises when Congress says, okay, Texas, you guys can be sued also. Joke's on you. So even after 
Bernie, De Flores. RIFRA remains on the books as applied to the federal government. And it was that statute that was at issue in the Hobby Lobby case, which we'll talk about later in this term, right? Religious employers sued the federal government under RIFRA because it's still allowed, it's still applied. Okay? Anything else? So you get that. All right. So the bottom line, right? The bottom line of Bernie v. Flores is this congruence and proportionality test. That when we're considering whether Congress can waive a state's sovereign immunity, we have to assess the injury. Is there actually a constitutional injury, and how big is it? Congress, though, does not have the power to redefine injuries. It's only about remedying existing injuries. Okay. Questions on Bernie B. Flores? Um, so they discussed the enforcement clause or this section. was a test to yes. The so the test, clause. the current case law to understand section five, is congruence proportionality. That's right. the, that's the case we have. So my question is, is is the enforcement clause, is it? Oh, always, the enforcement clause of section five is also called that. Right. Is it always associated with um, the necessary and proper clause? Oh, what a good question. Why did you ask that? Um, it's from the bottom of page four thirteen. Um, this line really stuck out with me. It says, um, the court did not authorize Congress to pass general legislation upon the rights of the citizens, but corrective legislation that is such as may be necessary and proper for counteracting such laws that the states may adopt. Right, so in Article One, Section 8, we know we have the necessary and proper clause, which gives Congress an applied power to some other stuff. The 14th Amendment was ratified about 70 years after that. And it operates in a somewhat similar fashion. It gives Congress the power to enact additional legislation that is appropriate to ensure that rights are not violated. Now, it doesn't use the language necessary or proper. It uses the word appropriate. Mm -hmm. But if the court were to use the phrase necessary and proper, how broad is that, Lisa and McCullough? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, it, how broad is it, Mr. McCullough? Is, is that very deferential to Congress? Yes. Very. So the court did not apply McCullough here. In fact, they said the test under the appropriate language is stricter than the test under the Commerce Clause and the Necessary Proper Clause, right? It's a stricter test because it must be both congruent and proportional, not merely, you know, convenient or conducive, whatever language Marshall used in uh, Marbury, uh, Marbury McCullough. So in that sense, the Enforcement Clause and the Necessary and Proper Clause should never be together. Well, a lot of people think they should. And there was some old case law that looks at the enforcement clause, which basically said it should be treated the same way as necessary and proper. Um, Bernie deviated from that. Yeah, Brandon. So they're not saying that the uh, necessary and proper clause is what validates section It's irrelevant. Five. Necessary and proper has no bearing on the 14th Amendment. It's a, total separate, it's a totally separate uh, uh, source of authority. <laughs> I guess, okay. It's 14th Amendment was ratified 1868, you know, nearly nearly 75, 80 years after the Bill of Rights was ratified. But is, but is Section 5 deriving its independent punch from Totally independent. Proper? The 14th Amendment is completely independent of Section 1 of the Constitution, Article 1, I mean. And if you think about it, the 14th Amendment was, was ratified in the wake of the Civil War and during Reconstruction where Congress basically made a determination that the states couldn't be trusted. That's what it was, right? They said the states cannot be trusted to protect the civil rights of their citizens, so we will enact the 14th Amendment, which guarantees certain rights, and if the states fail to comply, we can take appropriate action. And one of those pieces of appropriate action is a civil lawsuit. 
that allows people as private litigators, right? Private attorney generals can go after the states. So from the earliest days the 14th Amendment was understood to allow the states to shut down, I'm sorry, to allow Congress to stop states violating the rights of their citizens. Now, you know, having the state run a lynch mob against you and having the state deny a zoning permit are not the same thing, right? They're not even remotely the same planet, but they both derive from the same source of authority. So I mean, what may have been appropriate in 1868 perhaps may not be appropriate in the year 2017. Right? The word appropriate has that sort of um, uh, uh, context-specific interpretation, right? What is appropriate now? But the court here does not give it a very flexible meaning to say we should look at it very strictly. Uh, yes, Crystal. I'm struggling with this a lot, and I might be jumping the gun, but does the word appropriate, is that where the three levels of scrutiny come out of, where rational basis test and strict scrutiny apply? Um, you're, you're thinking the right track. Um, not exactly, because when you're dealing with federal legislation that, uh, um, I'm sorry, when you're dealing with state <laughs> legislation, you don't need Section 5. It just is it, does it deny the protection of laws, right? The notion of scrutiny does not come from Section 5. Section 5 is only going to matter for your purposes when Congress is waiving the state's sovereign immunity. It doesn't really come up anywhere else. And then my second question is the test that is derived from this case, the proportionality in that test, that test sounds almost identical to the rational basis test. So well, it's not. It's actually not. I think it's, it's, high, it's higher than rational basis because you're requiring a fairly good fit. Rational basis, we'll do, we'll do this later, but rational basis, review basis, I mean, can Congress make up a reason why they want to do this? If the answer is yes, it's valid. This is stricter than that, for sure. In fact, before Bernie, people simply assumed the rational basis test applied to the Section 5. And so long as Congress can have a reason why they're doing this, it'd be upheld. Right, so you see the progression. Oh, it's okay. You see the progression from Hans Chisholm to Hans to Bernie, right? that this notion of sovereign immunity has been expanded from something that may or may not exist to something that exists so broadly that limits Congress's powers. So not only are Congress's powers limited by the Constitution itself, Congress's powers are limited by state sovereign immunity. It checks on what they can do. Melissa. Um, so they explain how to remedy these injuries, but how do they define what the injury is exactly? Because I feel like they're subjectively interpreting an injury. Well, the way they define the injury is saying read our old cases. Read our old cases, and if we recognize this is an injury, then Congress can fix it. But Congress can't recognize and redefine new sorts of injuries. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I got caught up in your language. Um, what did you say? Congress's powers are limited by what? Now? State sovereignty for sovereign immunity, right? Mm -hmm. Congress wanted to enact the statute; they couldn't because of state sovereignty. It stopped them from doing so. It stopped them from enacting RIFRA as written. <laughs> Okay, what else? What else? Okay, so we're gonna get Bernie, right? We're gonna get Bernie, right? Congress can't waive Texas's sovereign immunity because the injury asserted was not one recognized by the Supreme Court. It was a newly defined constitutional injury. The means are not proportional to the ends. Good. Um, after Bernie, there were a number of cases uh, in fairly short succession that uh, reaffirmed this rule. So, for example, in a case called um, a, 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 a Kimmel uh, versus Florida Board of Regents, there was a question of whether um, age discrimination, right, so say that the state discriminated on the basis of age, could Congress allow a lawsuit on that basis? And the court said no, right? Age discrimination was not something that uh, uh, violates the Equal Protection Clause. Um, uh, therefore, it was not a big enough injury. There was another case in 2001 called the Board of Trustees of the University of Alabama versus Garrett. And this considered whether the states could be sued for discriminating against people with disabilities. The court said no, 
that's not an injury that has been recognized by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court not said that discriminating against disabled is a constitutional injury. Therefore, they tossed that case as well. Then we come to Morrison, which, which we, we read already. We read it in the context of the Commerce Clause, right? Carl, are you next, I think? So remind us, what were the facts at issue in Morrison? Well, we also read this case a couple weeks ago, I guess. Yep. Um, so uh, the Morrison, the plaintiff, was suing um, her school, I believe it was Virginia Tech. Very good. Um, right. What, what was her claim? This was Christine was on column, right? What, what was her claim? Her, her claim, because she was raped on the campus, I believe, by two students, uh, her claim was that there was a violation of the VAWA and uh, I guess the 14th Amendment allowed right. her to bring this suit. Very good. So again, we mentioned this last time, she was raped on campus by a couple football players. Um, she couldn't sue, I mean, well, she could sue the football players, they had no money, right? She wasn't going to get a penny out of them. So she brought suit against Virginia Polytechnic University, which was uh, uh, an instrument of the state of Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia. <coughs> Um, we studied last week that the provisions of the Violence Against Women Act were a violation of the Commerce Clause because Congress can't regulate domestic violence, that domestic violence was not economic activity. But there's a second part of the opinion about whether <coughs> Congress could waive the state's sovereign immunity. That is, could Congress even allow for on college to sue in the state court in the first place? Right. So let's go to our test. All right. Let's look at our test. <clears throat> there must be a congruence and proportionality between the injury to be prevented or remedied and the means adopted. So Kevin, what was the injury, the constitutional injury that was being as asserted here? I think it was the um, rape the occurring, them not enforcing the. Um, what well, was it? Was it just? Was it just the, the act of rape? Or was it something else? Was they're not enforcing the law? Well, no, but, but, but that's the second question, right? What is a constitutional injury that, that Brazoncalo is asserting? What actually did Vala prohibit? What was the actual statute? It, the statute said nothing about rape or battery, right? What, on the basis of? There you go. So Vala sought to eliminate crimes of violence and motivated by gender, right? The statute. Even though it was called violent, violence against women, it wasn't just for women, it was anything. So if a, a woman beats up a guy, it applies just the same. So it applied to crimes of violence motivated by gender. Okay? So we go back to the 14th Amendment. If you haven't studied it, so I'll give you a, a preview. The Constitution generally prohibits government-based discrimination on the basis of gender. Generally, there's some caveats, but it generally does. But here, they didn't just say that Virginia Tech can't discriminate. They said that the state can't even allow private actors to engage in this gender-motivated crime. Okay? Uh, let's see, David, did the court find that this injury was within the scope of the Supreme Court's you know, case law? Has this been an injury the court recognized before? Um, no. Okay, that's right. Why is the answer no? Well, I think it's kind of like with uh, that they're like overreaching their power. Okay, good. Why? <clears throat> I guess this section sought to punish private persons. Uh, so it's kind of like Congress, I guess, trying to criminalize, I guess, private actions. Good. Very good. So what the court basically says here is the reason why the means, right, are not proportional to the end, is that this is at bottom private conduct. It's private conduct by these two football players, right? VAWA is not aimed at correcting constitutional violations of state officers, right? Indeed, we learned in Prince, Congress can't force state officers to do stuff. Um, Instead, right, it's trying to perhaps prevent bad conduct by private actors. 
individuals who committed criminal acts. The law has nothing to do with Virginia government officials. It's directed simply at private actors. Okay. So that's one part of its holding, which which is I think I think everyone can, can more or less grasp. But the second part of its holding, right? The second part of its holding is worth important, right? Uh, Adam, what does the court say about gender bias? Justice Rehnquist's opinion. Why can't this be a way, a prophylactic, to stop gender uh, uh, discrimination, right, and gender bias, right? Couldn't it be said that if we prevent violence against women, there'll be less discrimination in society and Congress can remedy discrimination by stopping violence? Isn't that a plausible argument? The actions that would need to stop So see what he just said, right? You can certainly make the argument that in order to stop gender bias more broadly, we should stop violence against women. But the court says that goes too far. It's too stretched, right? Um, in order to stop a problem, there has to be a very close fit. There must be a congruence and proportionality. And the sort of remedy that they want to you know, allow the state to be sued uh, 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 doesn't fit with what they're doing. In other words, there's not enough of a connection between stopping gender-motivated violence and ending gender bias in general, right? They go too far, specifically because violence has traditionally been a state matter and not a matter for the federal government. Okay. And in one of the more uh, infamous lines of the opinion, Justice Rehnquist wrote that uh, the record does not show that gender stereotyping exists, right? Um, and then Justice Souter jumps all over him for that in dissent. Okay. So questions on Morrison, right? Morrison is, is, is a good application of the test in Bernie. And it basically holds that the remedy Congress sought, allow the state to be sued, was not justified by violence from private actors. Questions on Morrison? Yes. Because the private actors didn't represent the yes. uh, state? Yes. That was part of it, yeah. David? Is it considered the, like, the laws that, I guess, are like, strict enough, or is that kind of like a yeah. Well, uh, Justice Rehnquist mentions this point. He says, if the laws of Virginia don't permit a remedy from, for, for the, the, pla the, uh, the, the plaintiff here, then Virginia's got to rethink their, their act, right? Like, if Virginia can't give a remedy to this woman who was raped, then there's something wrong with Virginia. Um, indeed, I don't think she got a remedy, so maybe there's something wrong. But it's not for the federal government to repair. Yes, David. And so also with the concurrence of proportionality, because I noticed you talked about that, you know, the section 1391 applied to the entire U.S. and it wasn't targeted enough. Yeah. Yeah, Rehnquist made a big deal about this. What, what was his argument there? It was that, I mean, just basically, I thought it, was, it wasn't specific enough. You know, right. that it couldn't, they couldn't, it was beyond the scope of Section 5 to pass a law that was so broad that the remedy needed to be more specific. Yeah, and this actually goes back to Lopez, right? What sort of findings does Congress have to make? If they say there's gender motivated, uh, gender bias, do they have to say it exists in all 50 states? Or is it enough to say that uh, the gender bias exists in four states, or, or 20, oh, sorry, 21 states, but remaining the world? But Rehnquist has a big fuss thing. Look, they didn't make the adequate fi findings. OK? Any other questions on Morrison? 
So the next case then should have you scratching your head, huh? <coughs> hips. Um, have to. Brandon, give me the facts of hips, please. This case was about um, about equal protection with regards to uh, family medical leave. Okay, good. At work. What what it, what happened to Mr. Hips? What happened to Hips? Why why did he go to federal court? Amber? Uh, he wants to take care of his wife and uh, filed for 12 weeks of FMLA. What's uh, FMLA? Uh, that's fine. You're right. What, what, what was it stand for? Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, family and med medical leave. Okay, I'll come back to you in a second. So, in 93, uh, Congress enacted FMLA, Family Medical Leave Act, which basically says that if you need to take up to 12 weeks, basically three months of leave from work, they can't fire you. Um, now that's not paid leave, that's just, you don't have to go to work. Um, after that, your job may not be secure. So anyway, we're gone. Oh, well, so he left and uh, didn't, didn't come back and so they fired him. So what did he do? Um, he sued in uh, federal court. Right, saying that basically retaliated against him because of his FMLA rights. That's basically what they are. Uh, the question was, does the 11th Amendment permit the suit? Right? Amber, what did the court hold? Uh, they found that it does. Or, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. The 11th Amendment does not bar the suit. Why is this case mm -hmm. different from Morrison, which was decided a couple years earlier? Um, it's different because of the fact that it's not going against specific individuals, it's going against the state itself, the state itself. Okay, so this is state actor, that's good. What else? Um, it's going against the state itself. Okay, so there's a state actor, that's good. What else? Um, it makes them create an actual law within the state to allow for them, for people to okay. accept FMLA. Okay, very good. So there's another aspect too that I want, that I want to focus on, right? Um, David, the court talks a lot about gender stereotypes, gender bias. What, what are they, what are they getting at over there? Well, uh, it's usually because the court felt that gender stereotypes of women would have to take off the so what was the injury? Let's go. Let's, let's keep going back to our test here, David. What was the actual injury that Congress was trying to remedy? People losing their jobs because Well, but what's the actual injury in terms of gender stereotypes? You said it before. What's the actual injury? The discrimination. Okay. It's basically this, right? That if you're a woman, you're gonna have to take time off from work for baby or whatever else and you won't come back, so the women won't be hired. So the argument's this. One of the reasons why Congress enacted the FMLA was to combat that stereotype. That way that all employees, men and women, will be allowed to take time off from work without fear of losing their job. Right? That was the injury that Congress was trying to remedy. And the court held that that remedy was sufficient Right, that injury was sufficient to justify the lawsuits against the state. And it's true, Amber mentioned this a minute ago, here we're not suing you know, football players for you know, whatever private crimes, it's a state employer who is engaging in this act in violation of the federal law. So section five permits this, right? Because the injury of a, a gender-based stereotyping is sufficiently important, it can justify the waiver of the sovereign immunity. Unless you look perplexed. Just, You're next anyway, so you look perplexed. I'll call you in a minute, but you look perplexed. Um, no, this case just tripped me up a little bit. It tripped you up? Why did it trip you up? What, what, but what, what bothered you? you I, I get tripped up too whenever I read this case. I have the same reaction. What, what tripped you up? It just... I just feel like it's all very subjective, what they determine is the injury. Yeah. Okay, everyone heard what she said. She, she said exactly right. Like, why is the gender-motivated crime in Morrison an injury, but the gender 
motivated stereotypes here, not an injury. I'm sorry, I flipped it. What, why is the gender motivated crime in Morrison not an injury, and here the gender motivated stereotype is an injury? Anyone want to take a stab? The yeah. scale of it? I don't know. I, that's what I have. The scale? Okay, go, go, give me more about the scale. Well, in Morrison, it was one woman, maybe complaint like. So 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 maybe that um, the, the 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 question of, of rape on campus was something of a smaller scale than something that happens to every employer in the, in the country with it, which is basically taking care of families. Is that maybe what you're getting at? Yeah. Is it? No, it's not. Tell me. I think so. Maybe it wasn't part of the national conversation yet, whereas FMLA Work, was workplace leave is something that everyone understood. Maybe, right. David. Well, isn't domestic violence the same? Didn't Justice Breyer make that argument, saying that you know, when women are, they're not going to go to school, they won't get jobs, et cetera, et cetera? But I feel like this is a much more, like, I guess, direct influence on the workplace than the domestic, like, I can hear it, right, but I uh, Oh, I don't know if I'm right. I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, could it be that it includes both females and males, not just Oh, so it's not so specific. Maybe, maybe Jay. I was going to actually piggyback on Amber and say that that's, um, in Morrison, it was more of a, um, still a social taboo almost, um, in a lot of ways, whereas this is oh, more yeah. applicable. People get it. Yes. So it's, it, it's a more well-known injury. And accepted. Okay. Anyone else want to say something? So some years ago, Justice Ginsburg offered an explanation why, uh, Chief Justice Rank was voted in Morrison against Brazoncala, but he voted here in favor of Malay. And Justice Ginsburg chalked it up to life experiences. She said that Rank was his daughter at the time, was a recently divorced single mother, demanding career. So Ginsburg basically said Rank was had a soft heart for his daughter. Think about that for a minute. That the fate of constitutional law can pinch on a judge's daughter. In fact, there's actually there's numbers on this that say that judges with daughters uh, tend to rule differently in gender cases than judges with sons only. Which maybe you can think about it. Google that. There was a study on this maybe a year or two ago on this. I don't know the numbers at hand. So uh, in the note for the Hibbs case next semester, I put that little blurb from Ginsburg in the textbook. Unfortunately, you don't have it. Oh, by the way, the supplement is available. Uh, I got it last week. Um, Go bother the bookstore guy and tell him it's available, or buy it on your own from the uh, publisher. But the supplement does exist. I have a copy in my office. So I know it exists, but you can go buy it now. Okay. All right. So questions on Hibs. All right. Let me let me synthesize today. Some of a weird class it doesn't really fit in well. Um, we often talks we often talk about restraints on federal power in terms of internal. Right? Is it within the enumerated powers? Right. Does it violate the First Amendment, or the Fourth Amendment, or the Fifth Amendment? But federal power is also constrained by this principle of sovereign immunity. Now, sovereign immunity is stated nowhere in the Constitution. Indeed, in Chisholm, the court said no such doctrine exists. Do the Eleventh Amendment disagree with that? Maybe yes, maybe not. But by the time we get to Hans v. Louisiana, the court embraced the notion that the Eleventh Amendment is superfluous that this notion of sovereign immunity exists from the time of revolution. And then by the time we get to Bernie and Morrison, and these other cases from the 90s, the court establishes that sovereign immunity is real and that Congress can't waive a state's immunity unless they have an appropriate reason. That is a reason that is both uh, congruent and proportionality to an actual constitutional injury and not something Congress made up for itself. Any questions? Yes, David. So, the Hobbs versus basically says that the 11th Amendment is superfluous. It wasn't needed, yeah. And I mean, that still, idea still stands. Yep, it's a crazy idea, isn't it? Yeah. It's crazy. If you ever want to get a law professor angry, say Hans was correctly decided. You'll just, you'll, they'll, they'll start spinning their heads around. 
It's a tough decision to reconcile, but I think the best way of reconciling is Chisholm was wrong the day it was decided, and this principle of sovereign immunity was always there, and Iredell was correct. And if you take the position that Iredell was correct, then Hans is fine, it's unobjectionable. Anything else? Uh, have a happy Constitution, uh, Constitution Day. September 17th, Sunday is Constitution Day. Uh, uh, and I will see you all uh, next week. Thank you. Actually, are we having a Constitution Day celebration? I can't remember. Uh, yes, on Tuesday the 19th. On Tuesday the 19th, we'll be having a Constitution Day celebration in this building. I will be speaking, so go see it. At uh, 1230. Yes. It will be me, Kelso, and um, Rose.